Hi, good morning. It's really amazing to be here with all of you today. My name is Kelly, and I am a veterinarian. I'm also a mom, a partner, a kind of crazy runner. So that's my crew. Emmy is 12, Nina is 10, Archie, or Archibald Maxwell, John Karens, you can call him my handsome prince, he's eight. John, I won't tell you his age, he's very young. And then we have Ashi and Oshi, they're twins, brothers, they're nine. That is Winston Zetamore Karens, he's three. He is the very sweet but poorly mannered Labradane. Yes, he is on my kitchen table. <laughs> Shame. Uh, and the new addition to our family is Mia, 14-year-old German warm blood. She's a gem. So let's talk purpose. There's been a lot of talk lately about how to determine your purpose. The benefits of having purpose and the increasing need for individual purpose. I was recently particularly struck by the popularity of this topic when it was the focus of an edition of Hidden Brain, which is a popular podcast that's broadcast on NPR. So I was listening on a Sunday run, which is super typical for me, and the host, Shankar Vedantam, was reviewing the three ways to find purpose. So the first is passion-driven purpose. This is innate and at the core. The second is a life event of such significance that it informs and defines your purpose. And the third is watching someone else live their purpose and cultivating yours through that example. Now, Cornell University psychologist Anthony Burrow explained why purpose is not something to be found, but rather something you need to develop from within. We have data, I always love when there's data, that tells us that having a sense of purpose is vitally important for well-being, both for our physical health and our state of mind. There is growing research that shows that a clear sense of purpose is one of the cornerstones of human flourishing. According to Richard Davidson, the founder and director of the Center for Healthy Minds, purpose has emerged as one of the single most important predictors of well-being. People who have a strong sense of purpose tend to be more satisfied with their lives in general. They also tend to have better physical health, more quality relationships, and even improve brain function. They actually also live longer. Yes, having a sense of purpose predicts longevity. Did you know that having a strong sense of purpose is one of the most important predictors of mortality? It is true. People with a high sense of purpose live longer. Purpose is also correlated with less mental and physical stress and physical ailments. It also confers a benefit to cognitive function, both over time and with aging. Having purpose also fosters life satisfaction. In a study of about 100,000 people in almost 100 countries, people that had a stronger sense of purpose were less likely to judge their lives based upon how much money they made, and they were also more satisfied with the money they already had. Having a sense of purpose has also been correlated with objectively greater net worth and income potential, and that is an extra perk. And last but not least, having a sense of purpose also dampens impulsivity and increases resiliency. Essentially, having a well-defined sense of purpose helps mitigate the negative impact on you when you are faced with stressors. Wow. I mean, it would seem that having a sense of purpose is like having a secret superpower. So you are probably thinking that I'm gonna spend our time together talking about purpose. How you can find your purpose. Sage words to crystallize the amorphous, the aha moment, how to find purpose when it's not readily apparent. Nope. Lack of purpose is not triage high on the whiteboard for our time together today. Lack of purpose, it probably has a 10 hour wait before it gets out of the lobby and into your exam room. If you know what I'm talking about. I submit to you that our industry 
that us as individuals, we do not suffer from an absence of purpose. We are born of purpose. We all have purpose through passion. That is why we are here. That's what drives us. It's what compels us to take one more add-on to ease the concerns of a worried pet parent, right? It's what drives us to find the resources at your hospital to treat the patient for a pet parent that does not have the financial means to do so. It's what lives in our hearts as we cry, mourning the loss of a patient as though we were part of that family. I wanna thank you guys for coming to my talk today. It's really awesome and um, I'm just grateful. Oh, come on. <laughs> Caffeinate. <laughs> I mean, we're done, right? Clearly, it's puppies and roses, right? We can't possibly have an opportunity to improve our satisfaction, our happiness, our wellness, our health. We simply can't, right? Because we are probably just about the most passion-driven, purposeful group of people out there, right? Come on. OK. But I do suspect that some of us are thinking some of the same things right now. What gives? How can we be such a passion-driven, purposeful group of people with such a relatively high burnout rate, high suicide rate, substance abuse rate, and physical and mental exhaustion rate? Yes. <laughs> Love you. I'm talking to you later. <laughs> I submit to you that there's duality to everything. What if I told you that this superpower called purpose can also become its own kryptonite? Call me out. Call shenanigans on my deal. No? What are you talking about, Kelly? We're born of passion-driven purpose. We are forged in its flames, right? But often that comes at the expense of ourselves, in which we can lose ourselves and lose the ability to set the boundaries we need as individuals as we strive to consistently serve our purpose driven by our passion. We sit at a unique intersection as a group in which fulfilling our purpose Living our passion oftentimes puts us at diametric odds with what we need as individuals for self-care, family care, for balance, for sustainability over time. We have all been there, right? Taking a vacation when the rest of the team is too short staffed to cover, it feels bad. Having to leave after 12 hours and not squeezing in that seventh add-on, because God forbid you gotta pick up your kid at daycare or your dog at daycare or just do something for yourself. We also live in a bit of a groundhog day. At times it's glorious, right? When you see your fifth new puppy or kitten visit, or, okay, intern is hat coming on, when you scope the two feet of telephone cord out of that very sweet but poorly mannered Labradane. <laughs> oh yeah, I ride that high for a few weeks. What about that young dog with like a potassium of 10 and a sodium of 115 and severe azotemia and hypovolemic shock? And it's donezo, right? Oh no, because you know what's happening here, right? Pred fixes everything. And a little mineral of corticoid, right? That's awesome. But at times this is emotionally exhausting. When you've had your sixth euthanasia of the day on the sixth work day of the week, we feel, we care. We are there for our pet parents and that can sometimes deplete our reservoir. Look, we know this has been true for a very long time. Let's just go throw a global pandemic on top of it with all of its operational challenges, the concern for the safety of your team, home and work-life seesaw balance. Oh, and just for fun, why don't we toss an increased caseload of, what is it guys, 25 to 30% more patients coming through your door? And pet parents that are also navigating the stressors of the current climate. Good times. <laughs> we are here today to talk about creating a climate for sustainability in that space. Despite the curveballs, the stressors, the dumpster fires, and the reality of the day-to-day -day grind. So what's the solution? What can we do? How can we achieve this? There is so much we cannot control. 
So let's focus on the things you can control. What do you have the power to influence? What brings you joy or decreases your stress? What patterns of behavior do you have that create potholes for you? As I considered how to best spend our time together today, I thought about the conversations that I've had with myself through my personal and professional journey, the conversations I still have with myself on a daily basis. Many of these are reflections on how I could have done better, navigating a situation, responding to a peer, finding a solution. Some of them are check-ins I have with myself when I'm feeling particularly frustrated, trying to unpack the why behind the feelings. These conversations, over time, have begun to sort themselves into solution-oriented themes. These themes have become my personal checklist the principles which help me keep my terra firma when things are going sideways. Now look, I'm not here, up here, to tell you that I have a guaranteed prescriptive solution, right? There's not a one-size-fits-all roadmap in the sustainment of one's happiness in their work. But I do believe that we can create a system of organization to support achievement of our own sustained happiness. You have a treatment plan for each of your patients based upon their underlying disease process, right? You have a system at your hospital in which you create consistent medical records, right? Why should your sustainment of your professional happiness be any different? Your patients matter. Your pet parents matter. You matter. So yes, I talk to myself. <laughs> It is actually the first principle on my list. Check in with yourself regularly. First, you need to create the time and space for this to occur. For me, it is on my daily run. My run is the time that I can turn down the static, the background noise of all the things, to talk to myself and see what shakes out. I always ask myself, what's going well? What is currently bringing me joy? And I sit with those things to see if I can find a deeper meaning in the why there. And I also sit with the things that are irritating, frustrating, upsetting. And I ask why? What's going on there to create those feelings? And how can my actions help course correct? Is there a pattern? Is there a theme? Am I stuck in a groundhog day? I never know what seed is going to sprout during these self-therapy sessions. Sometimes I come up with a solution to a problem where a door will open to answer a question I've had. This presentation, in fact, was birthed on about mile nine of a long run last summer, and I do believe there might have been a text message verbally dictated to Dr. Chrisman whilst running, Eureka, Adam, followed by a phone call later that night. He will tell you it is true. Sometimes I... I just give myself the time and the space to vent and get it all out so I can move forward and not get stuck in a dwell. I'll admit, sometimes I just make my weekly grocery list. But as you check in with yourself, ask yourself, what's going well now? And what's going sideways? What can you do to course correct the sideways stuff? And what patterns, if any, do you see? Where do you want to be in the future, and are you currently directionally correct? And then create a system to remember what comes out of these self-check-ins, and hold yourself accountable to the action items and the follow-up you set for yourself. Check in with yourself. Set yourself up for success. How? Set goals, achievable goals. Set expectations, realistic and reasonable expectations, both of yours and of others in your space. So I also call this one, don't be surprised and angry when you leave a ham bone on the floor next to your poorly mannered but sweet Labradane, tell him not to eat it, walk away, and he eats it. Or, don't sign up to be an extra in the movie Snakes on a Plane, and then be surprised when you get on and there's snakes on the plane. All right, sidebar, 
I am actually known as the queen of crazy analogies at Thrive. <laughs> we gotta face, like that is an amazing movie. Who's seen it? When I started running, I set a goal to run a mile. One mile, not a marathon. The goal was achievable. The expectation was realistic and reasonable. Setting a one mile goal at a time allowed me to run my first marathon in 2006. But this applies to more than just running. So I was having a check-in with a teammate at Thrive recently. We were discussing a project that was, we were both involved in, required a lot of work, it was very complicated. And we were feeling frustrated and unsuccessful with the current progress. In analyzing the whys, we realized that the goals we set for this project were not achievable. The project had too broad a scope and complexity for us to successfully execute it by the deadline that we had somewhat arbitrarily set. The expectation was not realistic or reasonable, so it could not be met. So we noodled, we reframed the scope of the work, the timeline and the deliverables so that we and the rest of our team could be set up for success. Okay, here's another example that I hope will resonate with most of you. It surrounds the patient discharge process. Dun, dun, dun. This for me in clinical practice as an internist was a huge area of opportunity surrounding setting myself, my team, and my pet parents up for success through realistic and reasonable expectation setting. And y'all, I learned this one the hard way. So we've been there, you've been there, you work hard all day. You're trying to your best to do your best for your team, your patient, and your pet parents. You have someone who can't pick up their pet till later in the evening, past your normal working hours. You think, no problem, my bases are covered. My superstar technician has got this down, or my amazing DVM colleague. Things are great, right? Till you get to the clinic the next morning, there's a note from the day before and a voicemail. The client is not pleased. Where were you? You were expected to be at that discharge. Nobody else is an acceptable substitute. Don't you care? Clearly none of the work you did the day before was any good if you're not even there for the discharge. And you must have been out drinking Mai Tais and getting a massage if you weren't there for the discharge, right? Sidebar, you had to pick up your kid or the cops were gonna be called. <laughs> That's when it hit me. This was on me. I did not take the time to set realistic and reasonable expectations for my pet parents and I own it. So I thought about a solution on a run. Every client who elected to leave their pet for the day with plans to return later for pickup would receive this communication invoice from me. Hey, Ms. Smith, Colin to give you an update on test results so far for Fluffy and discuss plans for the rest of the day. We are really pleased to be able to offer pickup until 10 p.m. as a courtesy to our valued pet parents. Now, my department and I are only here till 6. If you'd like to speak to me in person, please be sure to arrive no later than 5.30 so we have ample time for me to answer your questions in person. Should it be more convenient for you to pick up Fluffy after this time, one of the emergency technicians can discharge Fluffy. Now, please be aware that you may have to wait if you do this because they might be tending to emergencies. They will have your written discharge statement, but they will not be able to answer any questions you have. If you would like to take advantage of our extended hours discharge option, I will go over your discharge instructions with you now via phone, because I want to be sure to answer any questions you have at this time. Any additional questions that arise, we can address through a phone call tomorrow. Y'all. I hope some of you use that if you've had a pothole with discharges. And I did not have one single failure to meet an expectation of a pet parent or my team surrounding discharges after this process was implemented. So set expectations and goals, realistic and reasonable expectations and achievable goals. Set yourself up for success. Control the controllable. So I also call this, you do you. You can only control yourself and how you react to situations and people that are out of your control. 
In other words, be a part of your solution and not a part of your problem. When have you been a part of your problem? Hmm? Get out of your own way. So I am frequently a part of my problem, and it's fine. I have no shame. But I am getting better about getting out of my own way. For me, it usually comes in the form of what I like to call the dwell. Most of us have been there. You have an interaction or a situation that didn't go perfectly. Maybe it's a conflict conversation or a situation that went sideways. So you leave the office, you leave the hospital, you hang up the phone, you disconnect from the virtual meeting, but you can't get it out of your brain. You're replaying it over and over. Maybe you're mad, maybe you're frustrated, maybe you're sad. How much physical, mental, and emotional bandwidth do you use stuck in that space? Has it ever impacted other things? Interfered with other projects or goals? Had a cascade effect on interactions with other people or related to other topics? So ask yourself, how can you get out of the dwell? Or better yet, how can you prevent the dwell from happening in the first place? We have too much meaningful work to do in the care of our team, patients, and pet parents to get stuck in this space, right? We could spend the entire Fetch conference on this topic and the tools and resources that you can use to achieve this goal. Now, at Thrive, we have a comprehensive set of resources and courses for our team members that I'm super grateful I've been able to avail myself of designed to support in this area. EQ, emotional intelligence, conflict resolution, time management, leadership training, and more. All of these things with the goal of supporting how we react to situations, to be a part of our solution and not a part of our problem. Because these skills are the soil in which resiliency and wellness grow and are nurtured. So control the controllable. Leverage your strengths. What are you really good at? Most of us enjoy doing things that we're good at. And data, which I love, does show that people who can use their talents and strengths in their daily work are six times more likely to be engaged and satisfied with their work than those that don't. I mean, this makes sense, right? Intuitively? Yeah. So I have a bit of a confession. In my alternate life, I am a party planner. I'm, I'm totally serious. <laughs> my team knows it. I really like organizing events and the logistical planning and all the detail work that comes with that, as well as concierging an experience to make people feel special. So if I can add like surprises or presents into the mix, it is a double great day for me. And I am really good at it. I've received that feedback many times over the years, both for personal and work-related events, and I'm super proud of it. So, I stepped into the role of event coordinator when I was in clinical practice. I would plan and execute all of our clinic events, from staff appreciation parties to referral partner CE events. And listen, like I know it's not the norm for the medical director to run point on these things, but I was naturally good at it and I loved it. And my awesome practice manager, she ran point on other super important things that she was great at. Win-win. So I did think about digging up some 2 a.m. karaoke pictures from the last staff appreciation party we did in practice, and then discretion, better part of valor. I thought I'd roll with Archie's birthday party. It was a really good time, and that was really fun. So where can you plug in to contribute doing the things and using the skills that you're great at and you enjoy? Do you love to teach? Offer to lead tech training sessions at your hospital. Do you enjoy public speaking and interacting with the community? Spearhead an event for the community or your pet parents. Do you have a gift for writing? Maybe you can write the discharge templates your hospital can use in your EMR for commonly treated conditions. Consider how you can do more of the things that use your talents. Leverage your strengths. That's a good one. 
Know and embrace your shortcomings, AKA your weaknesses, AKA your areas for growth opportunity. <laughs> when can these be helpful? How can you leverage them? Hello, I'm Kelly. I talk too much. <laughs> Ask my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Sawyer at Alexandria Middle School in Pittstown, New Jersey. Ask my team at Thrive Pet Healthcare. I am the queen of verbal soliloquies at meetings. Truth. Sometimes a teammate or my boss will attempt to circumvent this with a work chat on our intranet. Uh -huh. My volley, the text chat novella. What can I say? Apparently a lot. So I want to tell you these are staged photos. That would be a lie. This was my wonderful teammate here, Brett, attempting to get a headshot for this conference, and I wouldn't stop talking long enough for him to get a good picture. <laughs> these were the outtakes. Like, you can't make this up. Oh, he's so gracious, though. He finally got one. I'm also at times exhausting to those around me. It's fine, I've been told it many times. Like I wanna tell you that I'm only this animated because I'm up on this stage today and that would be a lie. I am almost extremely excited about everything. <laughs> I will never forget my rotation through the cardiology, cardiology department at the beginning of my internship. So I thought I crushed it. I was asking great questions, I had well-formulated diagnostic plans. I, I was there, I was engaged. My review, I was exhausting to the attending clinician. <laughs> Let's just say it's not a coincidence that I'm up here for almost an hour with a semi-captive audience. <laughs> but jokes aside, shortcomings can become strengths. In many cases, if harnessed strategically, in the right amount, in the right place, and the right time. Just like a strength can become an Achilles heel in certain situations, we started our time today talking about this, right? We're passionate about our work. It's a strength. But it can at times become our undoing. If we don't temper it with self-care, with balance, with wellness. So flip the coin. What are your current shortcomings? What are your areas of growth opportunity? Look for opportunities in which your weaknesses can become positive attributes. Carve out the space and the time in which there is a need for more of what you can offer that in another situation could be a big old bummer. Know and embrace your shortcomings. Be a lifelong learner. All right, you're thinking, Kelly, we're at a CE event. We got this one down. Not that kind of learner. Be open to learn and receptive to feedback. What can you take away from every interaction? Sometimes the things that are the most frustrating, difficult, or disappointing can present an opportunity for you to learn something. Apparent losses or missed opportunities may actually be a door opening to an even better brass ring for the grabbing. Now, feedback can be hard to hear sometimes when it doesn't resonate with your perception. When something doesn't go your way, what can you learn from it? When you receive feedback from someone, what do you do with it? This is not always easy or comfortable, and I'm not sure we're hardwired as a species for it to be so but it pays off. So I have another confession. I did not get accepted to veterinary school the first time I applied. Right Sister. But I was devastated. This was certainly the first time in my 20 year life that I had ever not succeeded academically. Like there must have been a mistake. Clearly the admissions office had flipped my application with somebody else's like, there was no way in my mind that that could have been real. But it was. Now, li listen, we all know how rigorous veterinary school admission is. 
It always has been, and I'm sure it always will be, right? Not being accepted on one's first attempt is by no mean a badge of failure in any way, shape, or form. But this decision rocked me, like at my core. So after I stewed in the yuck that was my initial reaction, I decided I could do one of two things. Forget my lifelong dream of becoming a veterinarian or figure out what I needed to do to get accepted to veterinary school. So I sought feedback. I spoke with someone from the admissions office to see where I could strengthen my application. Now, there was nothing shocking or particularly novel in that discussion. At the end of the day, I was equally qualified with just as good an application as were the nine other persons competing with me for one spot in the next entering class at CSU. Now, she did give me some specific feedback on how to strengthen my application, but also said at the end of the day, the very same application could just as easily garner an acceptance letter. So I considered her feedback. I got a job. I waited. Fun year. I applied again. Again, denied. <laughs> again, I spoke with the admissions counselor, but this time I listened and I doubled down. I enrolled in a local community college. I took a few classes, micro, cell, histo, to demonstrate recent academic success and to strengthen my GPA with some A's to counterbalance my less than stellar performance in undergraduate physics and inorganic chemistry. <laughs> Apologies to my husband, who is a physicist. <laughs> I started teaching. SAT, GRE, and medical school entrance exams for classes for a well-known national test prep company. And I eventually became a master trainer responsible for training all the new instructors in the tri-state region. I dove into my work, managing a lab and doing primary research at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. And this garnered a publication. And when I applied to vet school again, my admissions essay was authentically me. It spoke of my history, my experience, and my ambition with humility, rather than the somewhat brash note I now realize my first two essays had rung. This time, I was accepted! Woo! <laughs> you knew it had to get there, right? Because I'm here today. <laughs> Wait, she's not a vet? How did she get in here? She doesn't even go to this school. <laughs> what movie? Yes, <laughs> Mean Girls. This time, right, I had realized my dream through acceptance of my failure and willingness to learn from it. What's that old saying? Third time's a charm? Be a lifelong learner. I love this one. And me so thirsty. Choose kindness. Let's agree to stop the mean kids club. We have to have each other's back, right? In life and in this profession especially. It is hard enough to navigate the emotions and stressors that come with this job. Nobody else gets it. We all get it. In times of frustration, it might help to seek to understand the other person's perspective and assume the best intention as a default setting. Yes, this is hard. This can be frustrating. <laughs> it's frustrating when something appears on the surface to just create a problem for you. But what's behind the curtain? What don't you know? Give your teammates, colleagues, clients, the grace of their humanity. Choose kindness. Let's unite and not divide. We all have our heavy lift, right? But choose kindness for yourself as well. Give yourself the latitude to be human. It is okay to make a mistake. It's okay to not be perfect. Be kind to you. This is what I like to call the Jack Handy daily affirmation section of the talk. You are good enough. You are smart enough. And gosh darn it, people like you. So if you're too young for that ref reference, <laughs> I'm jealous of you, apologies, and you need to Google that. Choose kindness. 
Celebrate successes of others on your team, not just the big things, but the little wins. It's human nature to give feedback when something goes sideways or there's less than perfect execution of a landing. But sometimes the wins are easy to pass by in the chaos of the day. Create a system in which these successes are not easy to overlook. Create a space for them physically and mentally and let them be shouted proudly in whatever way works for your team. Maybe it's a team bulletin board on which, onto which shout outs can be placed or a kudos cup where team members can write stuff down and stick it in about other team members. So these are two hospitals in our Thrive family. Uh, Clark is in New England and Estrella is SoCal. They're awesome. And they both chose to participate in our Fear Free initiative where we support hospitals that want to get Fear Free certified. And they were just crushing it, crushing it, just doing an awesome job, super engaged. I was really proud of them, so I sent them cupcakes. <laughs> Don't forget to celebrate your successes. It's okay to be proud. You deserve the same recognition from yourself as you give to others. Talk to yourself and consciously celebrate you Celebrate success. Another one of my favorites. Have gratitude and show it. There's far too little gratitude in this world. So be a part of the solution. Think about all of the run of the mill things that happen on a Tuesday that everybody on the team does and where you can generously apply gratitude and get in the habit. It is amazing how much a simple recognition of someone's efforts can have a big impact on them. Many times it is the single most impactful thing you can do for someone, just to tell them thank you and express your gratitude for them. We recently asked our team members at Thrive how they like to be appreciated, and the majority said, tell me thank you and acknowledge my efforts. What an easy way to positively impact your teammates. We took this seriously during Tech Week in October, and we sent over 2,000 personal thank yous to our amazing technicians. It felt really good to me to write those thank yous because expressing gratitude sparks joy. We're moving so fast all the time. It is easy to forget to consciously express gratitude. Surely that person already knows I'm thankful for them and what they do, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but it feels really good to me when someone says thank you, even if I do know they appreciate my effort. So speaking of gratitude, it would seem disingenuous to not express some personal gratitude right now. This is Bob, and that's Scott. They are veterinarians. They're also super awesome humans, and they have become great friends. I am grateful for them, for their support, their mentorship and their guidance through my career, as well as the positive impact that they have made and they continue to make on our amazing profession. So thank you, Bob and Scott. Woo! <laughs> if you know them, you know. Seek opportunities to show gratitude. Okay. This is my absolute favorite one. Home stretch, people. What brings you joy? Do those things. Find ways to do more of those things. I have another confession. I have a bit of an icing addiction. I have had it for as long as I can remember, and it's pretty significant. Now, a few years ago, I became keto. Did you know they make keto icing? It is true, thank God, or I'd be doomed. I, I, I've been known to eat the icing off an entire tray of cupcakes. And gratefully, my kids hate icing, and sidebar convo we can have later, I don't know what's wrong with them, it's just weird. Um, but this had a, has allowed me over the years to eat the icing off every one of their pieces of cake and cupcakes. <laughs> it's really great. So when I was newly out of my residency, my team actually gave me a spray can of icing for my birthday. Y'all, I'd been working there three weeks when this happened. <laughs> <laughs> which clearly highlights how much I must talk about my love for icing. I mean, it is true, like they would find me in my office eating it. I tried to cram as much icing consumption into my workday as possible. <laughs> it brought me joy. Um, this did not prove to be sustainable, 
for a variety of reasons. I mean, I don't really know why, but my technicians were displeased uh, by the fact that sometimes during an endoscopy, I'd ask them to spray the tube in. <laughs> I wish I was lying. Oh, God. I told you I have no shame, right? One day, though, somewhat randomly, I came across an extra bandana at home. And I don't really remember where it came from, but I was trying to find something to replace the icing. So I had the idea to bring it to work and put it on a favorite long-term customer prior to discharge. So that is internal medicine code for hot mess of a chronic disease disaster patient. So you, got, you know this guy. It was a hyperlipidemic, chronic pancreatitis, diabetic, mini schnauzer. You know him, right? Yeah, you know him. So in other words, my favorite patient. Um, but the reaction of his mom will forever stick with me. She was full of joy. She was excited. She felt like she and her pup were special. And this filled me with joy. It was fuel for my passion driven purpose. And so it began, the age of the bandana. I was obsessed. I would go to the fabric store every few months, I would stock up. Okay, I want to be clear, there was not one kind of bandana. Oh no. There was a selection. Every season, every holiday, special celebrations, ones that were just pretty, ones that were super dapper. You know those dogs that need a dapper bandana. You see them, you're like, dapper. <laughs> My team had their marching orders. When they had downtime, they were to cut the fabric and create the bandanas. One size, one triangle, that would fit a large dog. Cut it in half to two smaller for a smaller dog. Cut it in half again for the cats. I'm a crazy cat person, we're not leaving them out. Now, to be, to be clear, there was equitable distribution of the workload here, make no mistake. I cut my fair share of bandanas in the total bandana world domination mission. <laughs> we need to talk about the operational protocol for the bandana selection and the documentation of selected bandana fabric into the medical record. <laughs> oh, this was super serious stuff. Like repeat customers had to get a different bandana every time. It would be disastrous to repeat a bandana on the same patient. <laughs> Let's just say my team strained a couple eyeballs from all the rolling they did in my direction. <laughs> but come on, I mean, they had to secretly love it. How could they not get some joy from the smiles on the faces of the pet parents upon seeing their beloved furry family member brought to them after their visit? super dapper in their bandana. Some of our frequent flyers would actually talk about the bandana at the beginning of the appointment. What would the fabric be today? <laughs> and some of them would wear old bandanas to future appointments. The age of the bandana was long lasting. In fact, it's sustained through my entire clinical career, moving with me through three different practice locations did. And with every bandana placed on a patient, I continue to feel joy, a rekindling of the spark that brought me to this amazing profession, to make a difference in any small way in the lives of the people who love these pets. So there were a lot of pictures I could have put up here, right? I went through the box. You know about the box. You all have it. You all have the box with all the pictures of your patients that you've taken, that your pet parents have taken, maybe you curate a few to put on your desk at the hospital, but there is a box in your house. I decided to go with some OGs from the beginning of the age of the bandana. I love these guys. This is Amanda Lee. She was a hot mess of a cocker with a chronic copper-associated hepatopathy that led to synthetic failure. She was bruising, she had ascites, she was no bueno. We biopsied her, we started treatment, and she lived for years. Like on, you know, the liver's amazing, right? On 10% of functional liver. Look how cool she is in that bandana. On the right, because I don't forget the cats, that's Wilson. He was a hot mess of a chronic respiratory kitty, so he had chronic allergic asthmatic airway disease, confounded by a mycoplasma bronchitis and lungworm, like the trinity. <laughs> Dude couldn't breathe. <laughs> he did great. Look how cute he is. And in the middle, that's Nina. Nina had like a horrifying clostridial enteritis that required a resection and anastomosis. 
And then she, yeah, right? And she got such bad dysbiosis from the clostridium plus all the antibiotics she needed that it was, by the way, that's code word for she had really bad diarrhea <laughs> after surgery. She was just a mess. And she had no fur and she was shivery. So Nina got a bandana and I bought her a sweater. <laughs> so you might be thinking, what about now? You don't practice clinically, no bandanas. It's true, I'm not practicing clinically. Do I miss it? Of course. Then why not do it? Because in my personal journey, in my introspections on keeping the spark alive, rekindling the spark to sustain my passion-driven purpose, I had a realization. How could I personally impact as many pets and people who love them? By supporting and making a difference to all the veterinarians and support staff on the front line, y'all who are the superheroes, directly, positively impacting so many pets and people. Now, I will say I've had to slightly modify my bandana operational process for the team members at Thrive. For some weird reason, some of them don't like me putting the bandanas on them when I visit. <laughs> By now, you know that's not serious. But my HR department did clearly communicate to me that they did not endorse my forced bandanaing of staff members. <laughs> so I had to be nimble, creative, and think outside the box. I present to you the kitten superhero cape. <laughs> could, we just dwell, could we just pause on this for a little? Just look, just look, just bask in its glory. No matter what's happening with you today, you cannot smile when you look at this. It's amazing. Look, I am grateful and humble to be able to support so many amazing superheroes in the scope of my current work. And the kitten cape award is my jam. This symbolizes a celebration of success, a shout out of gratitude, and it totally brings me joy to give them out to our team members. It is a triple win in one. In case you're wondering, the internet is a treasure trove of kittens and superhero capes. I mean, seriously, you could spend hours surfing to get images. Not, not that I do that on the clock. Occasionally, I will pivot to a Greyhound superhero cape if I experience a transient internet drought of kitten cape images. Because be real, right? Like the Greyhound is just a cat in a dog suit, right? You know it's true, right? Where's my cat people? The kitten capes have become a bit of a thing, really. Occasionally, somebody on my team will give a kitten cape to another team member. Super cool. That's sparking joy with lighter fluid and a match. So I would submit to you today, find your bandana. What is your kitten superhero cape? What drives you? What sparks your joy? Do more of those things. That was the last of my personal top 10 list for creating and sustaining happiness. And I hope that each of you found one small piece that resonated for you, that you feel you can take away from our time together and mold to help you rekindle your spark, to sustain your passion that brought you here to the best profession in the world. I am incredibly humbled by the opportunity to be here with all of you today. You are all superheroes. I am grateful for each of you and the difference that you make in the lives of so many pets and the people who love them. Y'all are amazing. And in parting, I give you all a kitten cape. Pick the one you want. And as you consider your roadmap forward, wear your kitten cape with pride. And as you do it, remember to be authentically you. Thank you so much.